Well, we kind of hear the same message, okay? That's going to be repeated a lot. So uh, we'll, be taking, we'll be taking our um, sermon today from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 24. And as mentioned here, Palm, so Palm Sunday is always a Sunday before Easter, which commemorates Christ's entry into Jerusalem. And so when we go back to this wonderful story, imagine yourself going through a family photo album and celebrating special occasions in your life. So that's exactly the approach that we're taking today. Now we go back to the Gospels and remember that special moment when Christ came at the right time to, pre to present himself as the Messiah and the King of the Jews. As we read this passage together, let's burn this story in our memories as though we were, to, as, as though we were there to see our Savior marching through the gates of Jerusalem. So there really isn't a, what we call a, a normal thesis or theme. Am I good? Um, so what, I mean, there's, no, there's normally a, a thesis that I usually give, but I just want you to have a theme here. And the theme is that this, this, the way we're approaching this passage is that it's a narrative. It's a story. And if there's anything that you can get from this today, it would be to worship Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, with that being said, why don't we all rise, and we're going to be reading this passage together. Begin. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard and he had done this to sign. Sorry, that was me. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look. The world has gone after him. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. And we'll go ahead and start from verse 1 and explain each verse as we go along. So thank you all. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now the next day is actually Sunday. Okay, It's referring to Sunday. And this refers back to John 12, verse 1, where John specifically gives a time, six days before the Passover. So to kind of give you an idea of what just happened, you know, we're just using our calendar here. So yesterday was John 12, verse 1. Okay, so six days after the Passover, so that's where it was. And then afterwards, Sunday, okay. So um, uh, six days before the Passover. So... Um, now we're at Sunday, which is the next day. So um, here 
you see on Friday, that's when that's where um, Passover takes place. And we all know that Passover for the Jewish person means Good Friday for the Christian. So that's how we normally remember it. Uh, we also note here that eventually, as we start to see the Messiah march through these gates, that Christ will eventually become the Passover. It says here, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And that's in 1 Corinthians 5, 7b. So now we go back to this portion here that I want to go over. It says here, um, the great crowd heard. The next day, great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So what did the crowd hear? They heard about Jesus, what, what Jesus did to Lazarus. People wanted to meet Jesus because he raised Lazarus from the dead and the miracle caused the whole people to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah in the following verse. Hold on, what did I do here? It looks like I eliminated one verse. Sorry, guys. Let me go to verse 13. Here's the following verse that we're talking about. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And so now that they heard what Jesus did, all these people are gathering and celebrating the King of the Jews walking through. So to kind of get into the festivity of things, um, let me ask a couple of volunteers to come up. Um, let's see. Daniel, can you come here? Come forward here, and let me see. Hey, Allison, do you want to come up here? Allison's like, I hope you didn't call my name. You want to come up here, Allison? Okay, I'm going to call Luis then. Hey, Luis, can you come over here for a minute? So I want you guys to take a branch in your hands, and I want you to raise it up, okay? As if you're celebrating Jesus' entry, right? I want you to imagine that. So raise it up, and then I'm going to have these people... When I read, took branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, I want you guys to read where it says Hosanna, and I want you to read it as such that you're excited that Jesus finally shows up to be your Messiah. You want to come with that, with that type of attitude, okay? So I want you to turn around to the people there, raise up your palm trees up high, even wave them up, like wave them up like awesome and stuff, right? All right, so they took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he. Okay, let's do that one more time. That's take one. Now we're going to take two, guys. All right, ready? Action. Took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and cried out. So it was an exciting time for these people. You may be seated, guys. Go ahead and put those um, branches there. Give a round of hand applause to our volunteers that helped out. And so they, what you see here, <clears throat> they were pretty much fulfilling um, a section in prophecy found in Psalms. I don't know what happened to it, though. I had it noted here, but for some reason it disappeared. In any case, um, what you see here is that they were excited that the Messiah has taken place. They just witnessed a resurrection over uh, at... Um, where Mary and Martha were. I can't remember the city off, off the top of my head. But they were celebrating that, and now, since they've witnessed that great miracle, they believe that Jesus is going to go ahead and break Roman rule. So he does something quite interesting in verse 14. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. And I want you all to note here that Jesus was going to fill all of God's word down to the detail. He even said this before this moment happened. So that's what I want you to focus on. Yeah, he sat on a donkey. He sat on a donkey because God wrote it in his word that he would sit on a donkey. And so God, Jesus is following God's will. He said in Matthew 5, 18, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one yacht or one tittle will, be, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 
And so Christ's actions are focused on fulfilling God's word. That's how much he loved the Father and how much he was committed to obedience. He rode the donkey because it was written in God's word to do so. And so let's, let, let's take a look at that quotation um, found in the Old Testament. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And this literally fulfills a prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so we see here Jesus fulfilling prophecy, but not only is this verse um, being fulfilled at that moment, but he also fulfills a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Let me read that to you in Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Now there's a lot of things to, to say, but I'm going to go ahead and break it down to a chart. And pretty much what's happening is that it's predicting when Messiah is going to show up. And it all starts, the countdown starts in Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 8 where um, Jerusalem is going to rebuild the walls. That's exactly what the prophecy of Daniel takes. Uh, that's exactly what the prophecy of Daniel says. And I want you to note that Daniel, when he was writing all this, was, was, it was taking place probably in the Babylonian Empire. And so now we're we're jumping way, way ahead to 445 B.C. So you notice that they, said, they mentioned 69 weeks, right? So that's sort of like that portion there, what you want to see here, is 69 weeks. When I say a week, I mean a unit of seven. Like, for example, when I say a dozen, it doesn't matter what I say, whether it's a dozen of eggs or a dozen of donuts. You know it's a unit of 12. So when I say a week, I don't mean seven days, okay? I mean a unit of seven. And so when they say 70 weeks are, are yet to be determined, we're talking about a week that's seven years, you know? So um, is it? Man, it's good to see that kid again, man. Is it um, Zaire? Nazir. Nazir, Nazir. It's good to see you, man. I'm glad you brought a friend over too, bro. All right. So anyway, we got... For every seven years, right, is counted as a week. And so that's what you want to count as 69 weeks. So to give you a, a quick summary of that. Second here. He, Artaxerxes, put an edict for rebuilding of the city as the first of Nisan in 445 B.C. Um, that's found in in the book of Daniel of John Phillips, the commentary. And from that date, to the Messiah, the prince, was to be 69 times 7 of years. So that's, a four, that's 483 years. So this time period, where we talk about the triumphal entry, that's supposed to be 483 years. And the Hebrew used a 360-day calendar, and so 483 years times 360 days is 17300 uh, 173,880 days. And based on Sir Robert's calculation, that shows to be the first, um, starting from the first of Nisan to the end of the 173,880 day brings us to the 10th of Nisan in the 18th year of Tiberius. And that's the day when the Lord made his public triumphal entry into Jerusalem and presented himself to be the nation as the Messiah Prince. So what I wanted you to understand, and I know that was verbose, 
is that from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, it calculated exactly the day that Jesus was going to show up. And that's why later on, when you read the Gospels, it'll say things like, Oh, Jerusalem, you should have known my day of coming. You should have been able to calculate it till that time. But they weren't able to see it. And so, anyway, um, it just works out that Jesus wanted to show himself on that 10th day. Now, for those that were in Guileo's Bible study, do you recall how after the feeding of the 5,000, people wanted to make him king? They wanted to make him king, but then Jesus was pulling away. Yeah, they were ready to go ahead and accept him as king, but it was not the time. And Jesus' goal was not to go ahead and win a popularity contest. He was there to fulfill God's word down to a T. And so that's why he showed up on this triumphal day. He showed up on this day to fulfill all of God's word, down to the dot, down to the cross T. And so I just want you guys to understand that from Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 26, is sort of like a mathematical calculation of knowing when Jesus shows up for his triumphal entry. All right. Now we go on to verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. The disciples were human just like us. They didn't know it all, and the Spirit needed to teach them these things. For those who go to Quileo's Bible study, this is the teacher that Jesus promised to give them after he was glorified. So it seemed as though they were veiled. They didn't understand that this was supposed to happen to him until after the resurrection. Then they were able to put it all together, and that was because the Holy Spirit was able to open their eyes to Scripture. We notice here, too, that this is something um, quite understanding because in John chapter 2 verse 22 it says therefore when he had risen from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said so there was a lot of things that Jesus was saying in this chapter that they didn't understand until after the resurrection because that's when the Holy Spirit was given to them and so the thing that we can learn here is that when it comes to scripture uh, we do need the Holy Spirit we need the Spirit to teach the Scriptures because we're going to be totally blind without it. Now we go to verse 17. Therefore the people who are with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. In the, in the NIV, to bear witness is to spread the word. That's what they said, that the Messiah is actually here. It was to declare, it was to declare that Jesus is here and he is the rightful king and so let's recall that moment when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead again. And today's sermon is like going, again, today's sermon is like going through a photo album. So let's go back to that moment. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen the things Jesus did and believed in him. And so these people that were in that crowd, all right, were also witnesses of Lazarus' resurrection. And they're saying, it's this guy. It's this guy that brought Lazarus out from that grave. It's him. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And so they were kind of like riling people up. They were spreading the news around Jerusalem to make everyone focus their attention on Jesus. In verse 18, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. And so they share a personal testimony of what Jesus did um, to actually show them his power and how he's the rightful king of Israel. So everyone was coming to Jesus because of this particular miracle. Verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And the irony of this whole situation is that the Pharisees supposedly knew scriptures, and yet they did not know that Jesus came to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And that's Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 
Notice the contrast between John the Baptist who recognized the Messiah and the Pharisees who didn't recognize him. In John chapter 3, verse 26, John the Baptist's disciples were concerned that all were coming to Jesus. However, look at what John says in John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. And in this verse, they wanted to increase and have Jesus' life decrease. And so that's the irony that we see here with the Pharisees. They did not want God to be glorified. And that's really hard to take, given from a person who's learned scriptures, but there are people like this who use the scriptures for their own personal gain. And so we see here how they did not want Jesus to be recognized. Now we go to somewhere interesting in John 12, 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Who are these Greeks? These Greeks were most likely um, people who converted to Judaism. The irony, though, is that even if they were converted spiritually, they were limited in entering the temple of God. And there was a special court for them to be in, but they weren't treated as full-blooded Jews. But these Greeks wanted to worship God. They wanted to honor Him by fulfilling the Passover. So here's the irony of things. You have a, you know, people who were raised in Scripture denying Jesus as Messiah, but you have these Greeks who don't really know too much, and yet they want to know who Jesus is. So these Greeks here, they converted to Judaism, and the sad part was they could not fully participate in all of the Jewish festivities. There was a separate place for them. Um, I don't know if you want to look at it this way. It was like um, segregation. It was literally segregation. They were segregated from um, the regular Hebrew people, the bloodline people. And so it was almost as though they were treated as second-class citizens in the eyes of God. And that was a sad part. But I want you to see their response in verse 21. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. As mentioned earlier, these Greeks were Gentile converts to Judaism. But notice that the Greeks went to his disciples to see Jesus. And the observation we want to make here is that people want to know more about Jesus if you spend more time with Jesus. You see, you notice that they didn't go to the Pharisees to know who God is. They went to the disciples and they wanted to see Jesus. And that's because these disciples, for three years, have been spending lots of time with him. And it's only natural... Uh, for people to be attracted to Jesus when we spend time with Him. And this is why we always drill in this congregation how we should be doing our devotions. If we don't spend time with Jesus, people aren't going to come to us to know who Jesus is. And so the observation and application we can get from this verse is that let's be like the disciples. Let's spend time with the, in the Word of God and know who Jesus is so that others would want to see Jesus. We go on to verse 22. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So when a person wants to know more about Jesus, we ultimately lead them to Jesus. And that's exactly what we see with the disciples. Verse 23. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And the hour refers to the time of Jesus' death and resurrection and, ex and exaltation. That's what John MacArthur says. So here, they're bringing in these Greeks, and the thing that comes out of Jesus is this. The hour has come that Jesus is going to be glorified. And he's telling, them, he's telling the Greeks that this is what's going to happen to him. They probably don't understand exactly what he means by glorification, but then he's going to explain to that. He's going to explain a little bit what that looks like in the following verses. But he is pretty much laying it down now. This is the time for him to die. You know, this is the time for him to die. So we go on to verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And what I want to say is that creation, again, always speaks 
of God's glory and always speaks of this concept of salvation and especially of reproduction. And he's kind of built it in the situation. I mean, how, let me put it this way. Why does it always have to be that way? Where in this world, when a seed, is, when we're supposed to have a lot of grain or a lot of something, something has to die in order for that to be um, abundant. And it happens with grain. So God initially designed it because it tells a story about what Jesus is going to do. So uh, literally what ends up happening is that this grain falls off from wherever it is, gets buried under the ground, and literally dies. It dies, and it no longer becomes a seed that it used to be, but becomes something far different. It becomes sort of like a shoot. Next thing you know, it keeps on doing the same thing over and over again until finally things get produced. And so I want you to understand this concept of dying. Okay? Because later on, we see what happens with um, the disciples and even with the first martyrs of the Christian faith. They all died. But as a result of their death, there were so many people that came to faith. Later on in the book of Galatians, Paul sets, um, sets an example for us to follow, or actually scripture for us to follow. And he says that, if any, he says in this concept that if we are to go ahead and follow Christ, that we were to die, we are to die among ourselves, die within ourselves, and to carry our cross. And so here, I want you to understand that Jesus is establishing a principle of what discipleship is. Discipleship begins when we die to ourselves. It's not us that saves. It's the Christ in us that saves. And so the more that we die to ourselves, the more Christ is shown. The more Christ is shown, the more people draw, are drawn closer to Christ. And our example is not to point people to how we live our lives, but to point them to Christ, who can live their lives through them. Here we see an analogy described by... Um, analogy that Jesus, is used, that Jesus used, uses in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 2, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to, the, to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. And so here is sort of like the explanation of the parable of the wheat dying and having a lot reproduced. That Jesus, glorifying himself through this death, was going to make many um, become disciples of Christ or to become followers of Jesus Christ. Now we go to John chapter 12, 25. He says, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And he gets this from the analogy of the wheat dying and falling into the ground and reproducing. But still, like to the Greek, it's like, what do you mean by that? Like, how... I mean, I can understand what you mean when I see in creation that wheat is dying, but then how is this connected to what you're saying? He who loses his life. Well, obviously what he's saying here is that he's talking about losing your life in this world because he explains here, he who hates his life in this world, right? So he who loves his life in this world will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So let's, let's put it this way. What if the seed decided not to die? What if it had a mind of its own? What if it says, no, I don't want to get buried down in the ground. It's dark over there. You know, I, I don't want that. So eventually, and I'll tell you this, seeds don't last very long. Eventually, it's going to decay. Eventually, a bird's going to come by and eat it. It just doesn't last. But here, eventually, if a seed kind of submits to what we call the initial plan of what creation says, you have to get buried under the ground, by their dying, then you're going to live. And it, that's exactly what happens with a seed. A seed goes down to the ground, right? It looks like it dies, but it comes out into something brand new. It doesn't look like the seed that it was before. Actually, 
when I used to like plant things in the ground, because I, I used to find like um, these pods with seeds. And I don't know, when I was living in LA, I just wanted to plant seeds and see what happens. So I planted them and I waited and I watered them. And then next thing you know, you start to see a shoot come out, but it looks like it has a little cap on it, like a little seed cap on it, right? Well, that's sort of like the seed dying already. It's no longer what it used to be. It's, it's risen into a new life. And so the idea is that he who hates this life in this world will keep it in turn, into eternal life. It's almost like a picture of what happens in nature. But again, like I told you earlier, if the seed said, no, nah, I'm not going to get buried under the ground. I don't want to. It eventually ends up dying anyway. But I don't want you to take that analogy and explanation, um, like to take my word for it. Let me go ahead and give it, give it to you straight from what the word of the Lord says. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He who hates his, he who loves his life in this world will lose it. And that's exactly what this verse says. A person who wants to love this world, but eventually loses eternal life and loses and forfeits his own soul. This is what it looks like to love your life in the world and also lose it. And here's the next one where it looks like that you hate this life in this world, but you have it into eternal life. Jesus directly says it. In Matthew 16, 24 through 25, then Jesus said to his disciple, after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so he directly explains what he was sharing with the Greeks. And so what I want you to understand in the triumphal entry, and let me go ahead and take you back into history, it was God's purpose. It was, God pur it was God's purpose for us to reign. But somewhere down in the Garden of Eden, we forfeited our reign and gave it to somebody else to reign over us. We gave it to Satan, or in a, in a way, we gave it to sin. We gave in to sin. So when that happened, a new nature corrupted us. Something was ruling inside of us that, that we really couldn't control, no matter how much we wanted to do good. You want to know why? Because when you go into the story of Genesis, you go into um, Abel and Cain. And I've told you this before, that mom and dad ever teach Cain how to kill somebody? No, he didn't. So where did this sin come from? It came from the fact that he inherited from, his, from Adam and Eve. And God told him, you know, that you, um, that if you offered a sacrifice that was pleasing to me, you would do well. But watch out. Sin is like lying at the door, and it's your job to control it. But he didn't control it. As a matter of fact, he allowed sin to reign in it. And so eventually, Cain killed his brother Abel. But we would, go, but we would think that would be the end of it. But no, in nature, we all see, and even in Noah's day, that sin was continuing to reign in all of the people. They did not want to acknowledge God or worship him. And so you thought that Noah was a good candidate after that. And, of course, during the great flood or the great deluge, he wipes out all of the world except for Noah and his sons, but you still see sin reigning. Although Noah found grace in the eyes of God, sin still reigned in him. So eventually... Um, we get all the nations of the world, and out of the nations of the world, we get Abraham. He picks him up out of the land of the Chaldees. Do you know where the Chaldees is? That's in Babylon. He picks Abraham out of Babylon, and somehow he makes this huge promise to Abraham, and Abraham believes God. But even if you thought that sin was already stopped then, it didn't. Because from generation, from Isaac down to Jacob, even when the law was given, the law could not control our sin nature. And the thing that we have to admit was that sin was reigning in us. It was king of our lives. You know, when you look at the, the system that was given in the Old Testament, God wanted to reign over their lives instead of sin. So he established the Ten Commandments. And so if they followed those rules, 
it would look like, it would portray that they wanted God to reign in them. But eventually that didn't happen. Because after the law was given, and we go fast forward into the book of Samuel, you know what they said? We don't want, we want a king, right? We don't want to be ruled by these laws. We want a king. And they didn't realize that Jesus, God was supposed to be their king. And God allowed another king to reign over them. So anyway, as we go down through the story of time, what we can conclude in the Old Testament that sin was reigning in us. It had, it had a, gr a strong grip on, grip on us. And even if God was sovereign and controlled everything, in our hearts, sin was king. Until finally Jesus shows up. And he says this, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he claims to, he claims to be the rightful king of Israel. So during that triumphal entry, and this is where I'm going to go ahead and bring on down from here, the triumphal entry was that moment when Jesus declared sin to be powerless and that I am the rightful king and sin will no longer reign in them anymore. And so that's why he had to do all that. So anyway, um, this is pretty much a story. I don't want to make it too doctrinal. I, I just want you to remember this moment where Jesus, predicted by God to show up on this day so that sin no longer reigns in you. Jesus reigns in you now and that you would be set free from sin. And that's the moment that I want you guys to remember. Okay, let's pray.